know what you're thinking. Weren't you just up here? Yes, I was, but it's always a joy to be able to get back up here and to preach. I do thank, for, thank the elders for these opportunities. I do want to make a quick announcement. I keep forgetting to um, tell the elders for the announcements, but we are having our Men's Digging Deep study as well this week. Uh, it will be on Thursday in the Annex. It will be at, from 6.30 to 7.30. doesn't run longer than an hour, so 6.30 at the Annex. If you still need the material, I've got a packet of information uh, in our pew, so please feel free to come by and um, pick up the information for that, and uh, we'll pick up from there. So we'd love to have you. King David had numerous political victories. He had defeated the Philistines. He had retrieved the Ark of the Covenant. He beat the Ammonites. He beat the Syrians. He was on a political high as a king. And then we come to 2 Samuel chapter 11. And that's when we see the great king fall into sin. And what we're going to look at tonight there's going to be two halves of this lesson. The first is the four ways that David fell into sin. And the second half will be the four ways of getting out of sin. And so the, in summary, we have, of course, sin and then repentance. It will be our two halves to this lesson. If you'd like to, we're going to look over at 2 Samuel chapter 11, and that is where we're going to start. Verse 1, it says, It happened in the spring of the year, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Now, from what I understand from cultural history is that it was typical for kings to go out in the springtime because good weather, not the winter, not yet into the hot months of the summer, and this was typical. It was also typical, as this verse points out, that the king would lead the army there. But we lead to our first point. In, in David's path to sin, the very first one is complacency. This is a man after God's own heart, and we will say that probably several times, but it's important to know that God gave him an anointed position to lead his people, and that included in these battles that he had been victorious in time and time again. But at this time, he became complacent. This is a warning for us today is that we may not be actively engaged in sin at the moment. But if you are in fact complacent, that is when Satan wants to go after you. You have to remember that Satan is real and Satan wanders this earth like a roaring lion, seeking those whom he will devour. And we've all seen the nature shows. and We always bring up this reference when we look at that verse, but we've seen the nature shows, and who do lions go after? They go after the strong, robust ones who are on their A game? No, they go after the weak ones. This is a warning is that before sin has ever started, before even temptation has even started here, complacency is a dangerous place for us to live as Christians. It leaves us vulnerable. It leaves us open for attack from Satan. And so we can see why those lukewarm Christians were repulsive to the Lord because they are weak. And we have to remember that we as Christians are to always grow. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a command for us to always be moving forward. Because in complacency is when we are most vulnerable. Now I move on to the second point. And before I get into the second point, I'm going to ask Michael, I'd like you to read James chapter 1, verses 14. Just 14, and stay over there, I'll need you in a little bit. James chapter 1, verse 14. We see it a lot, and I like teaching this point in the high school classes that sin really is a math problem. Go ahead, loud and proud. In that verse right there, as we head into the next one that he'll read just shortly, is that sin is a culmination of two things, enticement and desire. Now, what are those two things? This is important. This is how we're going to help prevent sin in our life, is that we have desire. Where is that? That is internal. That is the heart. That is the things that we desire that maybe nobody else knows about. And we have 
the enticement. That is the external. That is opportunity. So we see that when these two come together is when sin can't happen. That we have desire over here and we have opportunity over here. And that is when we are most susceptible to sin. Read 15 too, Michael. So we're going to keep going on this track. We have complacency as the first one. And this verse, this passage right here is very important leading into the second one and third one. We have the second one where there is temptation. Satan steps in and his weapon is lying. He's the father of all lies and he tempts. And so what he says, and let's go, let's go back to 2 Samuel and look at chapter 11. We're going to read verses 2 and 3 and it says, Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Stop right there. First of all, where was David? He was going out at night on his roof. Now, I'm not here to say if that was atypical for him or it was atypical for Bathsheba at this time. I don't really know. But what I do know is it's interesting when he went out, isn't it? He went out at night the cover of darkness. So before we get into that, the second point of temptation, we have to understand too is that he went out in a way for us to remember that nobody sees me. Nobody knows I'm here. Nobody will be able to see exactly what I'm doing. It's interesting, isn't it? Did the great king go out in the day? No, he went out in the darkness of night. And it is in that darkness that he was away from the light. He was away from what he should have been doing. And so we get to the temptation and we look at verse 2 there and we see that there was an external, it was that enticement. There was Bathsheba and she was bathing and obviously there was opportunity there mixed with his desire. There are two figures in the Bible that we need to look at at this moment. One is David. What did David do? We're going to read in just a little bit. He succumbed to those desires. The other figure I want to look at is Joseph. He was put in the exact same situation, and what did he do? He ran. He fled from temptation. He had the opportunity there, but he got out of the situation. This is so important for us today. Desires are hard to control. Desires are very difficult. It's a heart issue. It takes great work to be able to overcome them. But one of the first ways to prevent sin from happening in our life is to make sure that we are not in that opportunity. We don't have that enticement right before us. So we must remember that. And we see that we have sin that happened. We go on and we keep reading. And I want you to notice this. Look at verse 4 in 2 Samuel 11. It says, Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her, and she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house in five. And the woman conceived, so she sent and told David and sent, said, I am with child. This is when all of his problems start. This is when the great king who is on this great high keeps getting knocked down because of his poor choices. And this is what's important is that when we live in sin, when we decide to invite sin into our life, our decision making is compromised. And we will do one bad thing after another. Just look at what he does. We have here, we have adultery in verse 4. Okay, well that's not bad. That's okay. Everything will be fine. And then we have verse 5. I'm with child. You can't hide that one, can you? You just can't hide that one. But David's going to keep trying to fix the situation. Go over to verses 6 and verse 8 through 8. Then David said to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite and Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah had come to him, David asked how Joab was doing, and how the people were doing, and how the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah departed from the king's house, and a gift of food from the king followed him. He didn't go back home. David thought, I know, we'll just fix this problem this way. We'll bring the husband home. It didn't work, because he was a good man, and he stayed, stayed knowing that his his fellow soldiers were out there struggling. He did not want to go home. And so David's plan was thwarted again. So we keep going on, and what do we see? Look at verse 13. It says here that 
Now when David called him, he ate and drank before him, and he made him drunk. And at evening he went out to lie on his bed with his servants of the Lord, but he did not go down to his house. Okay, well, I tried to get him to go home. And now he gets him drunk. He's now involved him in sin on Uriah's part of drunkenness. And so David's sin is just spreading. It's going to others now in David's attempt to try to cover up this evil that he has done. And of course we get to 14 and 15. We know where the story goes, but look at how one thing compounded on another. And we're at 14, it says, In the morning it happened that David wrote a letter to Job and sent it to the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. I don't know the time frame of which this happened, but boy, that escalated very quickly, didn't it? But it shows how desperate man can be to hide our sins. The sin that started in darkness, up on a rooftop, and it has now led to a man being murdered by the highest position in Israel. It's something for us to remember is that when we let sin in, Oh, we can control it just a little bit. It's not going to be a big deal. It's not, I, I, I'm in charge. We can see how quickly things get carried away, how things escalate so quickly, and it gets out of our control. And so we move on, and we see this sin that has happened, and also it doesn't state it here, but this is something we need to remember when we sin. What are the wages of that sin? Romans 6, 23. We forget this. I think we do. And that's that the wages of sinner's death is that you are now spiritually dead. Adam and Eve ate of the fruit of the tree. You won't die, said the serpent. Did they die physically? No, but they died spiritually at that moment when they sinned. And we don't think about it as, oh, yes, I've sinned. You've died spiritually. You have stained your garments by your choice. And so we have this progression that starts with complacency when you're not doing what we're supposed to, and it leads to this temptation that is a culmination of desire and enticement, and it leads to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. We need to remember that is our condition when we live in sin. Sometimes we like to stop at sin. The whole truth, as Michael read there in 15, is it brings forth death separation from God. But the good news is we do have repentance, and what is the process of repentance? That's what I want to look at next. So we know that Nathan, boy Nathan, that, that is a character right there of strength and determination and, and trust in the Lord to go to King David and to deliver this message. And he brings forth a parable about and the sheep, and ultimately it comes to the culmination that when David said that this man was in the wrong, what does Nathan respond with? You are that man. He shows David's error. And this is where we're going to pick up on the repentance. Look at chapter 12 of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 13. The wrong chapter. Let me get over there real quick. Uh, sometimes my verses jump around. Bear with me just a second. 12, 13. Ah. So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. I think this is interesting how he brings this up. That's a very simple statement. He doesn't mention Uriah. He doesn't mention Bathsheba. He doesn't mention Joab putting him in a difficult situation putting in countless servants probably who knew this along the way. He, did, he goes straight to the point that I have sinned against the Lord. And that's something that we need to understand too. In the process of repentance, the very first thing, there's four things I want to look at is, is true repentance. And the first one is acknowledgement of our sin. There's a lot of ways people try to get around this, but the truth is it all begins with saying, just like King David did, I have sinned. Now, that's a very short verse here. You want a longer, more poetic explanation and repentance on David's part? Go to Psalm 51. Turn over there, if you would. 
Psalm 51 is a psalm that is from David to the Lord about this situation that he is in and in his repentance. And we can see numerous parts and aspects of true repentance in just this psalm right here. And so we see, look at Psalm 51 and verse 3. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. You must first make the acknowledgement that yes, I have sinned. Why does he say it's always before me? Because you know how it is. You know how it is that if you have done something wrong, that's on your mind. It's always before him. Look in David's case. No matter in repentance, you go back and you look at what Nathan, what God said through Nathan, whoo, that was heavy, okay? You go back and you read that. He says that, David, I've given you everything that you have, and you have done this, and he says that the sword will not depart from your home. And something else that we need to remember is that sometimes we may get this idea that, you know what, I'll just, I may be stuck in sin, but I can repent and it's going to be just fine. Sin follows. And just because we make it right with God doesn't mean there won't be consequences along the way. Something so important is, number 31, is that our sins will find us out. We need to know that truth. Maybe not in this life, but in the next. We'll be judged on these things that are done. And so we begin with this process of acknowledgement. And we move on. The next is an actual sorrow. And you can go in different directions if you want to and begin with this, but it's sorrow. And so look at Psalm 51 and go to verse 14. It says, Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. From that point on, what does David have to live with? He killed an innocent man to cover his sin. He abused his position of power. He sinned against the Lord and countless other ones. And he will forever have to live with that sorrow and that guilt. But don't you think that that sorrow and that guilt will stay with him and will and help keep him away from this, you know, possibly if something was going to happen again? It is an important aspect. Now, repentance is not just sorrow. And I want you to hold this place. I want you you got two hands, so on your left hand, I want you to keep it here in Psalm 51. With your right hand, go on over to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. I always enjoy this passage, reading this passage on repentance, because it explains it so well. And it's 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and I'm going to read verses 9 and 10. Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. There are two types of sorrow. We can see this. And worldly sorrow just leads to death. Why? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I won't do it again. Nothing has changed godly sorrow look what happens is that godly sorrow worketh to salvation and it's interesting it says here it leads to repentance god wants all to repent and come to repentance it's interesting those two passages right there show repentance is a process it's not just one-time action it is a process that we must go through and it is not just simply saying sorry but it is godly sorrow and that leads us on that was number two number three on repentance is asking for forgiveness go back to psalm 51 in the very first verse it says have mercy on me O god according to your loving kindness according to the multitude of your tender mercies blot out my transgressions very fancy way of saying it but ultimately acknowledging that sin and the sorrow that comes from it and having to ask for forgiveness we ask forgiveness from God. If we have wronged someone, then we ask them for their forgiveness. And this is such an important part. Because we saw over there in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, not to be regretted. So that when we are truly sorrowful and we go through this process, we can have confidence that when we ask God for forgiveness, He will. 
And it leads us to our last point. Now, before I state it, I want to read this in Psalm 51, verses 10 through 13. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. The last step in this is living right. True repentance is acknowledging your sin and and being filled with a godly sorrow and asking for forgiveness, but then doing the opposite of the sin that you were in. And you know what's so interesting is that this was an eight-part sermon, four parts on the sin side, four parts on the repentance side, uh, or on the repentance side, and the last one here that we speak about, about living right and doing godly work, guess what? That's at the very end over here, but what was the beginning of the sin problem? It was complacency. So how do we stay away from sin? We stay busy with good works. David went out at night in the darkness. If we live spiritually in the light and do those good works, we can stay away from sin. We can withstand temptation. We can overcome the devil at his game. How do I know if I'm truly repentant? You may ask. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. We read verses 9 and 10, but verse 11, very poetic in its nature. Follow with me in verse 11. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. Watch this. What diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, What vindication in all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Have you ever looked at those words? There's some heavy hitting words in there. What do they mean? How does it go along with what we're talking about here with repentance? Go back and look at that. It says, what diligence it produced in you. If you are truly repentant of sin, that's all you want to do is get right with God. Oh, I'll do it next week. I'm busy now. That is not diligence. That's not real repentance. Real repentance demands that you get right with God immediately. Keep going on. What does it say there? What clearing of yourselves. Clearing of yourselves is actually not like a cleansing, but rather an apology. It's a defense given. It's that I'm asking for forgiveness. That's what's showing there is that the clearing of your name, and it requires that admitting of sin there. What, keep going on. What else does it say? It says, what indignation. Now, that word can also mean a vexation. Vexing. It means to irritate. That means to bother. If you're truly repentant, it's because when you were living in that sin, what was going on? You were bothered by the sin that you were living in. It bothered you day and night. That's what required that action right away. And so that is part of that repentance. Indignation, what fear? What do you mean fear? If we're living in sin, we should never forget that we are not promised today. We're not promised tomorrow. And so that we are always at risk of judgment, of leaving this world in a lost state. That's a scary thing. That is a frightful thing, knowing that we can read in Acts 17 that by Christ, God will judge this world. And so we must always live with that. And that is part of the motivation, I believe, of staying right with God. So we have fear. Uh, Moving on, we've got um, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. I want to jump to vindication. That can mean acquittal. And there are people, I've seen them, that they repented of sin and they can't get over the sin that they were in. But part of this process is understanding if I am a Christian and I have truly repented then I can let go of that sin, of that sorrow, of that guilt. Well, how possibly could God forgive me? Look at David. David killed an innocent man just to be with his wife. But he was a man after God's own heart because when you go back and you look at what Nathan said to him, he said, you have been cleared. You have been forgiven. Tonight, as you sit here as a member of the Lord's church, perhaps you are in sin. Perhaps you have been living 
in some little sin that you want to keep hidden in the darkness. But understand something that all sins will be found out. They will be revealed to God one day, if not in this life. And perhaps you need to make it right. But perhaps you may be a non-Christian. You have not been baptized into Christ. Well, what's important to know now is that you are lost. You will face the judgment as a lost soul if the Lord came today or your life was taken today. But you can make that right. You can hear the Word of God, which you have. You can believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. John 8, 24, repent of your sins as we have just covered, looking at the whole body of sins that you have lived in and being able to say through this process, I can let go of all those sins. I can let go of all those guilt, that guilt that was associated with them. Confessing Jesus Christ as our Savior, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. And the also important aspect of baptism. Because all of this leading up to this does not wash away your sins. Acts 22, 16 is the act of baptism that cleanses all those sins. And the beauty is that you are now a New Testament Christian. And that if, if sin came into your life, that you are able to repent of them and it not stick to you. Whatever your need may be, please come forward as we stand and as we sing.